Now that we've covered the basics of containers and containerizing your applications, I'll show you where Kubernetes comes in. Kubernetes is an open source orchestrator for containers, so you can better manage and scale your applications. Kubernetes offers an API that lets people, that is authorized people, not just anybody, control its operation through several utilities. Very soon we'll meet one of those utilities, the kubectl command. Kubernetes lets you deploy containers on a set of nodes called a cluster. What's a cluster? It's a set of master components that control the system as a whole and a set of nodes that run containers. In Kubernetes, a node represents a computing instance. In Google Cloud, nodes are virtual machines running in Compute Engine. To use Kubernetes, you can describe a set of applications and how they should interact with each other, and Kubernetes figures out how to make that happen. Kubernetes makes it easy to run containerized applications like the one we built in the last lesson. But how do you get a Kubernetes cluster? You can always build one yourself on your own hardware or in any environment that provides virtual machines. But that's work. And if you build it yourself, you have to maintain it. That's even more toil. Because that effort is not always a valuable use of your time, Google Cloud provides Kubernetes Engine, which is Kubernetes as a managed service in the cloud. You can create a Kubernetes cluster with Kubernetes Engine using the GCP console or the gcloud command that's provided by the cloud SDK. GKE clusters can be customized and they support different machine types, numbers of nodes, and network settings. Here's a sample command for building a Kubernetes cluster using GKE. gcloud container clusters create k1. When this command completes, you will have a cluster called k1, complete, configured, and ready to go. You can check its status in the GCP console. Whenever Kubernetes deploys a container or a set of related containers, it does so inside an abstraction called a pod. A pod is the smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes. Think of a pod as if it were a running process on your cluster. It could be one component of your application or even an entire application. It's common to have only one container per pod, but if you have multiple containers with a hard dependency, you can package them into a single pod. They'll automatically share networking, and they can have disk storage volumes in common. Each pod in Kubernetes gets a unique IP address and set of ports for your containers. Because containers inside a pod can communicate with each other using the local host network interface, they don't know or care which nodes they're deployed on. One way to run a container in a pod in Kubernetes is to use the kubectl run command. We'll learn a better way later in this module, but this gets you started quickly. Running the kubectl run command starts a deployment with a container running in a pod. In this example, the container running inside the pod is an image of the popular Nginx open source web server. The kubectl command is smart enough to fetch an image of Nginx of the version we request from a container registry. So what is a deployment? A deployment represents a group of replicas of the same pod. It keeps your pods running, even if a node on which some of them run on fails. You can use a deployment to contain a component of your application or even the entire application. In this case, it's the Nginx web server. To see the running Nginx pods, run the command kubectl get pods. By default, pods in a deployment are only accessible inside your cluster. But what if you want people on the internet to be able to access the content in your Nginx web server? To make the pods in your deployment publicly available, you can connect a load balancer to it by running the kubectl expose command. Kubernetes then creates a service 
with a fixed IP address for your pods. A service is the fundamental way Kubernetes represents load balancing. To be specific, you requested Kubernetes to attach an external load balancer with a public IP address to your service so that others outside the cluster can access it. In GKE, this kind of load balancer is created as a network load balancer. This is one of the managed load balancing services that Compute Engine makes available to virtual machines. GKE makes it easy to use it with containers. Any client that hits that IP address will be routed to a pod behind the service. In this case, there is only one pod, your simple Nginx pod. So what exactly is a service? A service groups a set of pods together and provides a stable endpoint for them. In our case, a public IP address managed by a network load balancer, although there are other choices. But why do you need a service? Why not just use pods IP addresses directly? Suppose instead your application consisted of a front end and a back end. Couldn't the front end just access the back end using those pods internal IP addresses without the need for a service? Yes, but it would be a management problem. As deployments create and destroy pods, pods get their own IP addresses, but those addresses don't remain stable over time. Services provide that stable endpoint you need. As you learn more about Kubernetes, you'll discover other service types that are suitable for internal application backends. The kubectl get services command shows you your service's public IP address. Clients can use this address to hit the Nginx container remotely. What if you need more power? To scale a deployment, run the kubectl scale command. Now our deployment has three Nginx web servers, but they're all behind the service and they're all available through one fixed IP address. You could also use auto-scaling with all kinds of useful parameters. For example, here's how to auto-scale a deployment based on CPU usage. In the command shown, you specify a minimum number of pods, 10, a maximum number of pods, 15, and the criteria for scaling up. In this case, Kubernetes will scale up the number of pods when CPU usage hits 80% of capacity. So far, I've shown you how to run imperative commands like expose and scale. This works well to learn and test Kubernetes step by step. But the real strength of Kubernetes comes when you work in a declarative way. Instead of issuing commands, you provide a configuration file that tells Kubernetes what you want your desired state to look like, and Kubernetes figures out how to do it. These configuration files then become your management tools. To make a change, edit the file, and then present the changed version to Kubernetes. The command on the slide is one way we could get a starting point for one of these files based on the work we've already done. That command's output would look something like this. These files are intimidating the first time you see them because they're long and they contain syntax you don't yet understand. But with a little familiarity, they're easy to work with. And you can save them in a version control system to keep track of the changes you made to your infrastructure. In this case, the deployment configuration file declares that you want three replicas of your Nginx pod. It defines a selector field, so your deployment knows how to group specific pods as replicas. It works because all those specific pods share a label. Their app is tagged as Nginx. To illustrate the flexibility of this declarative method, in order to run five replicas instead of three, all you need to do is edit the deployment config file, changing three to five, and then run the kubectl apply command to use the updated config file. Now, use the kubectl get replica sets command to view your replicas and see their updated state. 
Then use the kubectl get pods command to watch the pods come online. In this case, all five are ready and running. Finally, let's check the deployment to make sure the proper number of replicas are running using kubectl get deployments. In this case, all five pod replicas are available. And clients can still hit your endpoint, just like before. The kubectl get services command confirms that the external IP of the service is unaffected. Now you have five copies of your Nginx pod running in GKE, and you have a single service that's proxying the traffic to all five pods. This technique allows you to share the load and scale your service in Kubernetes. Remember the Python application you containerized in the previous lesson? You could have substituted it in place of Nginx and used all the same tools to deploy and scale it too. The last question we will answer is, what happens when you want to update the version of your application? You will definitely want to update your container and get the new code out in front of your users as soon as possible, but it could be risky to roll out all those changes at once. You do not want your users to experience downtime while your application rebuilds and redeploys. That's why one attribute of a deployment is its update strategy. Here's an example, a rolling update. When you choose a rolling update for a deployment and then give it a new version of the software it manages, Kubernetes will create pods of the new version one by one, waiting for each new version pod to become available before destroying one of the old version pods. Rolling updates are a quick way to push out a new version of your application while still sparing your users from experiencing downtime.